여러분 안녕하십니까? 안녕. 반갑습니다. So uh, everybody is here today, and that's wonderful. And uh, I would like to give you the good news, but unfortunately I cannot. Everybody is an adult here. Only children want good news all the time. They only want something sweet. When the parents come home, children usually ask, "Mom, Dad, what have you brought?" When we come to this world, did we get any news? What kind of news did we get after birth? Ah. We were so helpless, we could only cry and breathe, and that's it. So then as we grow up, it takes us many, many years to learn, to talk, to walk, to feed ourselves. So then as we grow up, it takes us many years to realize who we are. And many times our parents, our friends, or school are very much ready to tell us who we are. First, we hear it from our parents. Ah. Oh, you are my son, you are my daughter. Or at school, yeah, ah, you're a good student, you're not so good student. Then our friends tell you, ah, ah, you're such a good friend. Or some other time, come on, you're not such a good friend. Ever since we are born, we get these ideas from other people who got their ideas from other people who got their ideas from other people. Ideas, ideas, ideas. How much truth is there? The Buddha was 28 years old when he saw one fundamental truth, and that was not good news. He saw that he would die. You can't call this good news. You can't sell this at the railway station. But it's the truth. So unless we get down to business as adults and we begin to see the truth, there is no way for us to grow. So first we have to see our real situation. We have a mind that wants perfection, happiness, and permanence. That's our mind. And our body is imperfect, impermanent, and interdependent. So it's like our hardware and our software, they're not compatible. Bad design. How we got into this situation? What do we have to do in this? Maybe our first job is to realize that it's a bad design. The name for this bad design is suffering. So the Buddha wanted to start with the good news after his enlightenment. He wanted to start with the actual good news that this whole world is created by mind alone. But nobody understood that. They were full of ideas and ideas and ideas. So the Buddha had to start with the situation that we can all see, we can all realize. That we start out with the bad design. The sign of that is suffering. This is the first of the Four Noble Truths. The fact of suffering. Why do animals not have that? They have, it, they have it in a very different way from humans. Or plants, or rocks, or inanimate objects. They don't have the notion of suffering in the way we do. Why is suffering so specifically human? If we don't understand that, we don't understand our own Buddha nature. If we don't understand the fact of suffering, we don't understand our potential for enlightenment. So if we don't understand the bad news, we will not, never understand the good news. So then the next step in the Four Noble Truths is the cause of suffering. And in short, without putting the 12 steps in our birth and old age and sickness and death, there's one word, attachment. We have these false identities in our consciousness and we attach to them and we suffer. And because of that, we have these dualistic views. And because of these ignorant views, we have desire and anger. When you perceive that, then you see the cause of suffering. And if you see the cause of suffering, you can also see the end of suffering. So when you don't have any attachments, when you don't have any illusions, when you don't attach to anything, your suffering stops. And there is a big difference between having suffering and not having suffering. When you suffer, you have a very strong sense of I. When you don't suffer, your sense of ego is gone, finished. It's not there. When you suffer, you and this world are separate and they are at odds. When you don't suffer, when you have no I, that means you and the world became one. Then what happens is that you return like a drop of water to the ocean. And you become the ocean. When we are born, we become this little drop that somehow evaporated from the ocean. And when we are born, we are this little isolated dew drop or water drop that has a memory of the ocean and wants to go back there. This memory of the ocean is called desire for happiness. So when we are alive, our major drive in this life, ascension beings, that we would become happy. 
But our greatest pain and suffering and frustration is that we realize we cannot be happy in the way we think. These are situations and relationships when you believe you fail. Then happiness becomes redefined, becomes something else. When you become middle-aged and you have a family, you realize your happiness is not in you, it's in your children. If you become a Sunim, you realize your enlightenment is not as important as all beings' enlightenment. That's much more important. So funnily enough, paradoxically enough, the greatest hindrance between happiness and you is your ego. So when you want to set out to the way to end the suffering, that's the fourth noble truth, there's a fundamental recognition. The way to end suffering is really to take away your I, my, me, your sense of ego. When you do that, happiness naturally appears as a byproduct. If you want happiness directly, you will always fail. It will just evaporate from your hands. It will disappear. And that's why this practice, the Buddha's way, is so important because it points to something much, much bigger than I, my, me. And part of that awakening is happiness. Scientists these days believe that we see 5% of the universe. What we can see with our huge telescopes and measure with our very fine instruments is only 5%. 95% we know it's there, but we can't see it. And the mind is the same. Many Western psychologists who investigated the subconscious had very similar results. We use about 5 to 10% of our consciousness. Where is the rest of it? We call that subconscious. Yeah. But if you're Buddhist, you know that your subconscious is not separated from you. It's not hidden somewhere. Everybody in this room is aware of the Buddhist view of mind and karma. Oh. We have the five physical senses, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and touch, the body. The sixth is our thinking. Yeah. It's like the CPU in your computer. Then there is the seventh, the controller that makes good and bad. That's yeah. where your sense of I appears. Okay. And the eighth, the Pajshik, that's your storehouse consciousness. And that's your huge storehouse where all your lives are stored. All your memories, which you cannot access, they are all there. Why do we forget all that? Why do we forget all our previous experiences when we are born into this body? There's a simple answer. Uh -huh. If you remembered everything, we would all go crazy. It's very simple. So you remember only what you have to remember. And the seventh controls the eighth. But the sixth, the CPU, makes the terms, the words, the concepts that the seventh and the eighth use. So we say, if you stop your mind and it doesn't move, you perceive your Buddha nature. Why? No. When you have the five senses and thinking and discrimination and memory, your mind moves. Always. Good, bad, high, low. I, you. Always moving, moving, moving. When your mind moves, you have past, present, future. Then you have three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. But when your mind doesn't move, there's nothing like that. When you attain this moment, in that moment, there is no past, present, future, good or bad, I or you. For that, the sixth, the seventh and the eighth, they have to stop moving. It's not just your tradition which you were born into or chose to follow. It's not just that. Yeah. It's not just your wonderful culture which you have inherited after 1700 years. Yeah. It's something fresh and live which is functioning full today, here, in this moment. That's why Dharma Desa or Bodhidharma formulated four very important principles of practice. Yeah. The first, he said, do not depend on the scriptures. Why? If you depend on the scriptures, you always check yourself. So your seventh, your eighth, and your sixth, they are always moving, moving, moving around. Do I follow the words of the teaching? Am I correct? Etc., etc. No. If you follow words and speech, if you follow scriptures, then you cannot see cause and effect directly for yourself. My if you don't see that directly, you cannot grow up. Yeah. When we cook something, we read the cookbook, right? But then we don't cook the cookbook, we cook the ingredients, <laughs> right? Because but if you cook the cookbook, no one can eat that. <laughs> and you use the knowledge, but you don't depend on the knowledge. Then you begin to improvise after a few years. 
Everybody understands that. Mm -hmm. Then one day, your family eats your kamja john, and they say, wow, tuk ching, wonderful specialty. Then they say, how did you do that? It's not like your grandmother or mother or sister. It's your style. How did that happen? Oh. You attained kamja john. So in Zen, we say, directly pointing to mind. When you directly point to human mind, you no longer depend on the scriptures. And then the third one can be realized, enlightenment by experiencing our true nature. That's very important. Many traditions believe that if you remember your previous lives, you are Buddha. Maybe, but not necessarily. Remember, all your previous lives are in your Pashik, in your eighth consciousness. Did you go beyond that or you just opened the book? Likewise, some people believe if they can do some magic, they are Buddha. That's also wrong. Huh? Maybe magic is part of big realization. Maybe it's some huh? demon. We don't know that. There are many, st many stories about Zen masters who got some magic, like Mangong Sunim, but Kyung Ho Sunim hit him with a stick on his head, then he stopped seeing through the walls. Yeah. Then we asked Sung San Sunim at Hwa Gyasa, Sir, why exactly did Kyung Ho Sunim hit Mangong Sunim? Why did he do that? Sung Jansen said, Mangong Srim had a colored demon. It was not enlightenment, but very high class demon, not a bad entity, but not Buddha, might become guest of his mind. There's a concept called mind guest, and that was doing all that. When your seventh consciousness is totally not moving. In other words, you don't have good and bad. You don't have distinction. And then your mind opens to higher realms. That's why we chant every day. It's not worship. When we chant, our discriminations disappear. And then higher Buddha and Bodhisattva realm open and connect with us. Now that's very important. Because enlightenment is not this. When you perceive your mind, then there is no mind whatsoever. No coming, no going. No high class beings. No special magic, nothing like that. What is there? Nobody knows. But everybody can experience. And when you experience, you instantly have mind-to-mind -mind connection to your teacher, to the entire world of sentient beings, to everyone. Because your mind became clear like space, clear like a mirror. No one can tell you what that is. And that's why the fourth principle comes very handy when we say transmission from mind to mind. Yeah. And that's the original transmission. When you observe that, then you know that all these special powers, all these great beings, they are illusion. That saves you from a lot of wrong ways. That saves you from powerful people who can steal your mind. Sometimes powerful people appear, sometimes very smart, very, very handsome, or woman, very beautiful. They say, I know everything. You must follow me. Then you take a few steps, you realize you've been caught. That's why in the Buddha's teaching, number one important point is every single sentient being has Buddha nature. No one can give it to you. You already have it. The only job you have is to realize it. Between you and enlightenment, there can be many hindrances. For that, you may need help to clear away. Oh. So your teacher cannot really give you anything, ah. but can help you in 10,000 ways to clear away your attachments, your uh, anger, your desire, your wrong views, all of that. And then your true direction becomes clear. We come empty-handed and we go empty-handed. What do we get? Yeah. That must be something which doesn't come and doesn't go. Yeah. That makes your practice very simple and, and very clear. And that's why it's wonderful that you come together and practice together with the leadership of the Sunims. Yeah. And I would like to encourage you to do that as much as possible. Yeah. If we follow this clear direction by our Buddhas and patriarchs, we can never fail unless we give up. Only if we give up. That's the failure. And then this direction helps you very, very much. So now if I can help you by answering any of your questions, feel free to ask. Uh, you said you, um, you know, observe your mind, uh, do you, then do you think there is mind? Who is asking me this question? Mind or not mind? Uh, can we really say this thought is our mind? Well, if you practice, there will be thinking, but no mind. If you practice, you will attain that. 
if you practice Huadu, Huadu San, you can, you can attain that. First, we ask the question, what is this? And maybe for many years we ask that question. And if you do that really well, then everything disappears from your mind, only the question remains. Then the question itself has to disappear. When that happens, there is no mind left whatsoever. And then your regular function returns. You start to think again, feel again, see, hear, taste, smell, touch again. But there will be no more I, no more mind behind it. So then your question will have a very good answer by your own experience. My answer can only point the way, and but you have to walk that way. Mm. More questions? The way we can just to stop the suffering is just to letting this I go, right? How can I let go of I? What do you see outside? Sky. Yeah. Was there an I in that? Very good. No. Keep that mind. Wow. Then you can go beyond suffering. Yeah. And then you can perceive. Even when you go to hospital and there's a surgery, you can perceive. So you fully perceive what's going on. And mm. pain is just pain. But there is no I. Yeah. If you identify with the body, there is suffering. Yeah. And that's why children, they don't like the doctors. Because, well, the doctor so causes me pain. Yeah. We all did, remember. But when we grow up, we stop being identified so much with the body and we don't identify the pain with the doctor so we have to stop the false identification then our i my me disappears then pain is just pain no. suffering is just suffering but it's not my suffering it happens in my body yeah. sometimes people hurt the feelings that i have that's all okay but i perceive it i fix it but i don't identify with it so pain is just pain but there is no good and bad judgment over it so when the mind is not affected by pleasure and pain, happiness and suffering, that mind is clear. But the same mind perceives suffering as suffering, happiness and happiness. There is no deceit or lying there. Your teaching was really great, and then, but um, as a like you know person in this world, you know we um, experience lots of um, you know suffering, right? Yeah. You know pain and everything, but. Um, He's, what he's just saying, like, you know, when you, when you think, when something happen, something bad happened, you mm -hmm. think like, oh, maybe this is what's happening to everyone. So this is life, you know. So if you have that kind of attitude towards the uh, uh, suffering, would it help? Uh, not by itself. It brings balance, but not a solution. So first, we have to see cause and effect. So when you see suffering, immediately you ask, what's the cause? Good. Then... We have to see how to take that suffering away. And remember, it depends on the cause. Mm. Many people with very good intentions, they try to take away suffering and they make more. This world is full of that. Why does that happen? Because we have not seen cause and effect clearly. Yeah. So the medicine becomes another sickness. Yeah. And this world is about that for hundreds and thousands of lifetimes. So when do we finally say, Enough. Your job to decide. Yeah. No one can tell you. Yeah. You want to make more, you will have more. Yeah. You want to be born a couple of more lifetimes here? If not, you have to stop all your dualistic feelings, thinking, memories, past, present, future, good and bad. Stop that. When you do that, you can really help other people. Yeah. Because what is really paradoxical, but it's deeply true, is that your personal liberation depends on your help towards others. There's no way you can do this just by yourself, isolating yourself from the other beings. Your personal deliverance depends how much you help this world. If not, then enlightenment would be a very selfish business. Then it wouldn't work. Then it would have disappeared long time ago. This teaching, this direction would have disappeared mm. long time ago. Okay, she's wondering what, uh, what kind of Huadu did you have? See, originally there is only one Huadu, and it's oh. by Yukcho Desa, the sixth patriarch. You know the story of the sixth patriarch. Good. You know, uh, it's one of the most fascinating stories in our Sonbulgyo history. And personally, he's my hero. I mean, he went uh, through so much. Okay. When he was chased by this ex-general who wanted to get the Buddha's bowl and kasa from him, you know, he puts that bowl and kasa onto a rock and he hides himself because he's afraid someone's going to kill him. 
this big monk, this ex-general, mm. captures the spot and sees, wow, there is the Buddha's bowl and the kasa. Now I become six better. He wanted to take that. He touches that, cannot move it, then became very afraid. And he calls out, younger brother, I will not harm you, please, come. Yeah, then this that. monk, Hei Myung, Sunim, he says, I didn't come for the robe and the bowl. I came here for the true Dharma. Please teach me, younger brother. Okay. So then Yuk Cho Desa, the real Hei Nung Sunim, he says, when you don't think of good and bad, what is your true face? Yeah. So this, what is your original face, became what is this? What is this essence in us? Then Hei Myung Sunim says, Wow, now that I hear this teaching, mm -hmm. my mind is clear like fresh water from a spring. So the, uh, hearing the question in that situation for him, Yong Sunim was enough to wake up. Yeah. Then he asks Hen Yong Sunim, besides this, is there anything that the fifth patriarch you know, taught you and transmitted to you? It's then he says, no, it's complete. That's it. Yeah. Then Hen Yong yeah. says, yeah. then I want to become your student. Yeah. Now watch yeah. this. Yeah. Then Hen Yong Sunim says, if you have this kind of mind, we are both the students of the fifth patriarch. Now, this is very important. It's as important as the question. Yeah. Because Hei Myung Sunim offered his mind, you know, on a plate to Hei Nung Sunim. Hei Nung Sunim could have done with his freedom, with his independence, with his self-respect, anything, anything. He offered it. And Hei Nung Sunim didn't take it. Very important. Your Buddha nature is yours to discover, no one else's. And that's why this question, what is this, is the only Huadu. Everything else is a Kongan, and Kongan is a case, it's a story, it has people, it has events, it has conflicts. So Kongans, we have 1700 of them, but only one Huadu. Continue. When you practice Huadu with words, like with every breath you repeat this Ige Murshinga, after a while, it acts like a magnet. It attracts all the metal. So your question attracts all your thinking, all your feelings, all your ideas. Everything comes back to one point. We call that the 10,000 dharmas return to the one. So this one point is your question. And as I said earlier, after a while, even the words of your question will disappear. But the question itself remains there. I give you an example. So somebody asks you, where is Busan train station? And you can stay, say, go straight ahead. But you can also do this. One has words, the other doesn't. The mind can do the same thing with the question itself. So you can have the words of the question, and the words disappear, but the question remains there. That's very important, because in everyday life, you have to talk, you have to see, hear, taste, smell, touch, think, you have to do all that. But still your Huadu doesn't disappear. If it didn't, you would have a big problem, and all of us would. Because then the mind would start to have this dialogue. What is this? Hmm, I'm drinking water. What is this? I'm using the microphone. What is this? It's a bunch of flowers. Now, that's not really good. It's not necessary. So don't attach to the words of the question. When you do Chamson, then Chamson use it. But when you go out of the Son Bang or the Son Wan, then use the mind, which is the result of your practice. Yeah, you That's said uh, uh, you said we practice yeah. to help others, right? Yeah. But uh, it takes lots of time. What's the difference between the helping others after you enlightened and then just with only um, understanding? What's the difference? Well, when you help with a very clear mind, your help becomes very effective. And if you have an unclear mind when you help, this help becomes another problem. Yeah. So you can always see whether you actually helped or not. Because if you didn't, then your help became another problem. Yeah. Now what's most important, do not prejudge your own mind. Try your best. Because if you get into a situation where you have to help, then don't check yourself. You see it. Do it or not do it. It's a one moment de decision. And when you decide to do it, do not check yourself. Try your best. Try your best and try your best again and again and again. There's one crucial decision at the beginning of this. 
It's one question. Is it my job or not my job to help in this situation? And if it's not your job, then call somebody who can do that. Like But, that's why we call a doctor, a policeman, a fireman, all kinds of people. Yeah. If we don't have this kind of distinction, then soon we will need help and we cannot give it anymore. So that's why our minds have to be really clear. What is our job? So when your mind is sufficiently clear, you have a correct assessment of the situation. You assess your situation correctly. Then you establish correct relationship. Yeah. And then you can perform correct function. Yeah. So if this moment is clear, then situation, relationship, function all become clear. And if it isn't, then more practice is necessary. Okay. Rest assured, everybody makes mistakes. Everyone. Yeah. How quickly do we see that? Can we see that by ourselves or we need somebody else to tell us? I mean, how quickly can we correct it? These are the questions that actually test you. Yeah. And this test never stops. Yeah. The both of them you asked in your question that it takes very long time to attain a clear mind. Oh. And with all due respect, I disagree. Repeating our karma hundreds and thousands of lifetimes, that takes a long time. It's tragic how much we don't see of that. Yeah. So relative to the amount of repetition that we have had so far in our distant past, in our 95% that we don't see, effort to get enlightenment, that effort, even if it lasts lifetimes, it's much, much less than the compounded and collected karma that we still carry. Even if you spend lifetimes to attain Buddhahood, it's much shorter than this repetition. What may frustrate you and me and many practitioners is that for a long time, for many years, we don't see any results. And your karma has results right away. You get what you want, or you said what you wanted to say, or you did what you wanted to do, and that has results right away. So the creation of karma is much faster than taking it away. Remember, our practice is not mathematical. It's not like an equation. You know icebergs. These icebergs break off those huge ice shelves and they start to float. It gets into warmer seawater. Remember that 90% of the iceberg is under the water level. You don't see it. But as it gets to warmer seawater, it starts to melt. But this melting is totally invisible from above the surface. Only if you go below, you can see it. For weeks, months, maybe even years, there is no visible result. But one day, the mass below the seawater level And the mass above the seawater level will start to change, you know, balance. Mm. So when the mass below the water becomes smaller than the mass above, it sh suddenly shifts and turns up. So this is really important because the mind works a little bit like that. So don't be impatient with yourself. Don't want to be a good student. Yeah. If you want to be a very good student, soon you will stop. Yeah. That's why just do it. Just practice. Okay. And with a very sincere mind, just practice without any expectation. Oh. I know how difficult this is to accept. Oh. Everybody out there wants success, result, profit, efficiency. We are surrounded by this. Yeah. So our bows are back pal, not pal e pal e. So I want to thank everybody for your wonderful presence today. I'd like to thank Visang Sunim and all the Sunims here for their wonderful work and their generosity. And all of you for being present with open eyes and open mind. And I hope to see you again in the foreseeable future to share the Dharma again. Thank you very much. Thank you.